All right. So as Roberto said, uh, I'm Piotr, uh, a PhD student from the West Pomeranian University of Technology in Szczecin, Poland. And together with Wesley uh, Malkorps from the University of Stirling, we will uh, tell you a little bit about the, Norway, Norway, about the value chain of the salmon in Norway and also common carp in Poland. And we would like to uh, compare between the industrial and cultural supply chains, because as you will find out from the presentation, uh, these two supply chains or value chains uh, differ a lot. Let's first have a look what we have on the plate today or in the menu. Uh, we will start with a short introduction to a value chain approach and how to collect the data for the value chains. Then we will jump into sustainability aspects of uh, value chain. Also, we will talk a little bit about power and interest towards innovation in uh, both uh, cases in Norway and in Poland. We, will, we would like to share with you also the opportunities that we identified during our field work, uh, especially in terms of processing and traceability. And we hope for a nice discussion with you and to draw some uh, nice conclusions from our presentation. Before we actually start, I have a question to you. Maybe someone can answer in the chat or can switch on the microphone. How would you define the value chain? Any volunteers? Come on, don't be shy. I'm sure yesterday, if you attended the presentation of Richard Newton, you might have some basic knowledge about the value chain. Product preparation process line. Yep, that is uh, somehow correct. Uh, actually, the term value chain was uh, coined in 1985 by Michael Porter, a Harvard Business School professor uh, in his uh, book, and it was first used to uh, evaluate how the product is uh, developing in one company. But since then, it was used uh, more broadly in the, in the world and it can be defined as a string of collaborating players who work together to satisfy market, uh, market demands uh, for a specific product or services. So the value chain analysis then is a, uh, a tool that explores these relationships between different value chain actors, or you can call them stakeholders, and how the goods and the services uh, are moving in it. So uh, the value chain analysis helps us um, to understand the different parts of the value chain and how they interact with each other and who are the uh, driving the innovation. So who has the most power and who is the most interest in driving the innovations? And by doing this, we can uh, actually see who's behind the wheel in a certain uh, value chain. So who's leading the, the innovation. It also allows us to identify bottlenecks for growth. And in our case, also we've been trying to identi identify bottlenecks for the eco-intensification. And as well as uh, the value chain analysis allows us to, uh, to check where the value added is. Uh, before we start with, with our outcomes, I would like to quickly tell you what are the key aspects of creating the value chain. So with uh, our survey, uh, we prepared it with the experts from several, several countries uh, that were uh, aquaculture experts and also uh, experts of sustainability. We defined our sample frame. So uh, you should always remember if you would like to pre prefer, pre prepare the value chain analysis, the survey needs to be adjusted to a specific part of uh, industry because some of the questions in the survey might not be relevant for the for a different uh, value chain and we also created a provisional indicators that were easy to collect from the uh, from the industry also were uh, very informative for us 
and on the other hand were relevant for the industry and to uh, so the survey that we uh, created was semi-structured, which means some questions were open, especially about uh, sustainability and innovations. While the others were, were while in the others, the uh, stakeholders were asked to uh, score some indicators. A list of the stakeholders is is uh, in the table on your right. Uh, we contacted all of them in each value chain we were assessing. And after the primary data collection, so the semi-structure surveys, we did a Delphi expert consultations, which means we wanted to make sure that the conclusion we drawn from the primary data, uh, that the stakeholders have similar uh, view on that scope as we have. And you have to bear in mind here that sensitive data collection relies on building relationships. So we used uh, all the partners networks uh, to engage the industry to uh, actually work with them to invite more people. And we used also something that is called a snowball effect. So during the field work uh, in person, uh, as you might know, it's very nice to perform such surveys in uh, person because online form is not always the best choice and and then if you uh, use like a snowball effect so you go from one person to another and they can introduce you to someone who might have also uh, very uh, important information for you and now uh, let's quickly see what species we've we've been uh, working on. So, of course, Atlantic salmon as the main uh, fish species produced in EU uh, with one and a half, almost one and a half metric million tons produced mainly in Norway. We also focused on uh, rainbow trout, uh, which is produced all over the Europe, but uh, we focused on Italy because it's one of the major suppliers of rainbow trout on the European market. Uh, we aim to assess also uh, sea bus, sea bream and turbot in Spain in, uh, and uh, Portugal, but unfortunately the COVID came and we were not able to uh, go there and assess the value chains of these species, but hopefully we can do it one day and uh, see what are the difference between them. And last but not least, common carp, which is uh, mainly produced in Poland. Uh, and within this presentation, we will focus on these two as the title of the presentation says. But before we uh, go to the production cycle and the value chain, I would like to ask you another question. Uh, which one do you consider sustainable? Carp or salmon? There is no bad answers for this carp. Okay. Okay, we'll see at the end if your perception will change on that. Both. Okay, so why we focus on salmon in Norway and carp in Poland? because uh, it's a comparison between industrial and the landscape fish. Of course, one is a marine species and the other one is freshwater. And another important thing is that Poland is a major hub of secondary processing of uh, salmon. As you may know, there is some huge companies that uh, process this, the salmon from Norway in Poland. That's why we focus on these uh, two species. And let's now jump quickly into salmon production cycle. So uh, as you might know, because it's pretty obvious how it, uh, how, it uh, how the production works, uh, we start in a hatchery to spawn the, uh, the fish in a freshwater, 
when they reach uh, fry size, so within about three months, they are transferred to the tanks or cages where they stay until the smoltification. So uh, they reach size around 100 grams and there is some manipulation of the temperature and salinity. And after they reach this 100 grams, they are transferred to the sea cages and for the growth phase, and they stay there until they reach market size. Of course, it's around uh, 22 months until they reach the market size in total. So it's pretty fast, I would say. And in case of common carp, it's a bit different and there is a lot of manipulations with the fish because it's very traditional. Farming, we start in the hatchery or in a spawning pond depending if you if the farmer is willing to use artificial um, breeding or just natural then the fish are transferred into the fry pond where they stay from may until october of the first year and then they are transferred to wintering pond that is a very specific pond it's around two meters deep and with a very high density fish stayed for the whole winter without receiving any feeding. So there is a high mortality rate. I'm sure yesterday Cornelia was talking a little bit about the mortality rate in the wintering ponds, but it's around 30% in the first year. And then fish are again transferred to the fingerling ponds for a second year of production. And that's again from May until October, depending on the uh, temperature of water. So it might be uh, April or May. And then again, transfer to the wintering pond uh, where they stay for the, another winter. And finally, they go to the uh, production pond, which are the largest ponds in the, on the farms, uh, sometimes reaching even 200 hectares. So you can imagine now uh, how big the, the farm may be. Uh, the biggest one is in the south of Poland which is called uh, millage ponds. Uh, they have few ponds that are 200 hectares each. And uh, what is important here that all, all the manipulations are manual, so you have to actually dry the pond. So they start two months earlier, earlier, earlier sorry, uh, to drain the pond, to flow or flush all the water into the river slowly and then they collect the fish so there is no pumps it's or all, all manual and that leads us to a comparison between both value chains we got the first main difference it's the grow out phase so in in case of uh, salmon the fish grow in the same cage for the whole uh, production cycle except the spawning and smoltification and in case of carp, there is a lot of manipulations, as I mentioned. So that's the first key difference in the value chain. And then second difference is, sorry. Second difference uh, is that salmon relies on, uh, on uh, formulated feeds. So marine ingredients are, are used to uh, create these feeds, as you may know, so pelagic fisheries, that's what the whole industry relies on. While in case of carp, carp relies mainly on agriculture since uh, for the carp, uh, the main source of our, uh, additional feed are grains, for example, triticale or wheat, depending on the market price. So whatever is cheaper, the uh, farmers use this as a main source of food. And also uh, natural food is here important, which occurs in the ponds. And the third key difference here is the slaughtery and primary processing. So in case of common carp, what we found is that it's not very, uh, it's not fully utilized. So all the processing uh, is on a small scale. It occurs mainly in the Christmas period since uh, it's a traditional uh, fish. So it's con it is consumed during the Christmas time. So uh, the processing is 
still on a small scale while in the uh, salmon as you may know it's uh, a fish that is highly processed and the focus in the case of uh, salmon is on the byproducts processing so how to circulate all the byproducts into the cycle of uh, of production or to how to use them in uh, different sectors and now i will pass the voice to uh, wesley who will dive deeper into the both value chains good morning everyone uh, Piotr, if you can click through that, uh, that would be helpful. So we can sure. keep the, the presentation up like this. Thank you. So, so as um, uh, as Piotr pointed out, um, we are um, looking here into a, an industrial uh, industry versus a, a traditional industry, the, the carp. And uh, in the, the top of the slide, you can see the um, uh, most important sustainability factors that were mentioned by the survey respondents in Norway. And um, you can clearly see that um, for uh, Norway, uh, most of the concerns are around the use of feed ingredients. So uh, to substitute marine ingredients, for example, so novel feed ingredients, uh, sourcing is a concern or an, an, an uncertainty. Um, and um, uh, compared to carp, where you um, clearly see that most of the concerns are around climate change, how does it affect water availability, um, and um, there are also uh, positive uh, sustainability factors mentioned around the potential of car processing uh, for the for the industry. So in the beginning, uh, when we um, uh, looked at the sample frame, we uh, collected the sustainability indicators that might be relevant for the for the different industries, um, and we asked the respondents to highlight the most important sustainability factors for, for each of the industry. And then when we take Norway, for example, uh, we can clearly see that the feed efficiency or the economic feed conversion ratio is considered an important economic uh, indicator scored, uh, scored high, but it's also a very important environmental indicator because most of the um, environmental impact can be related to the, to the use of, uh, of, of, of feed. While feed is also the majority of the uh, production cost. So this is a very important indicator. And when it comes to social indicators, uh, employee risk and safety uh, are considered uh, important. Well, this is not really the case uh, in uh, Poland, which is, is not an industrial uh, scale industry. And when it comes to uh, fish welfare, uh, fish, wel fish welfare training of the employees was considered very important and the number of mortalities. So especially for the Norwegian salmon industry, the uh, sourcing of the ingredients is, uh, is important. There's still a dependency on ma marine ingredients, even that the inclusion uh, declined over the past decades. But in order to meet the nut nutritional demands of the, of the salmon, this is, uh, it's still very important to, to include this. So efforts has been made to replace this with, uh, for example, uh, soy, uh, but there are also environmental concerns with the production of soy and uh, therefore uh, novel feed ingredients are being explored uh, the use of microalgae microalgae uh, also the use of uh, fish byproducts which i will come back to later in this presentation the uh, use of microbial biomass and, and and insects for example um, and when it comes to opportunities for the carp industry in poland this is uh, is processing so at the moment carp is often being sold alive uh, especially around the Christmas time, so it's very seasonal and traditional. And um, uh, yeah, so they're being sold alive. And there's concerns around fish welfare, there's concerns around, um, there's um, uh, people want to utilize carp more efficiently, utilize the byproducts more efficiently to make more, more profit. So uh, yeah, uh, processing is, uh, is being explored. And um, then the concerns around uh, farm performance and the climate change and how this can affect fish growth and fish disease um, and um, but also to um, communicate uh, sustainability in general with the final consumers big data can play an important uh, role here so think about sensors and salmon cages that monitor how the fish is swimming can monitor their behavior are they showing natural behavior are they feeding well uh, and they can also then monitor uh, 
uh, this in relation to the water temperature and, and uh, get new insights in how the the environment and the changing environment is affecting the fish performance. So these are all interesting innovations that uh, could add value to the industry, but then it is important to understand how does the industry operate and how is innovation uh, being uh, implemented. So therefore we ask stakeholders to score the other stakeholders, um, so their perception uh, on the power and interest uh, to, to innovate. So power in terms of uh, capital, finance, uh, knowledge, uh, labor to implement and uh, interest, of course. Now you can clearly see uh, in the top of the slide that uh, most of the dots, the value chain actors, in Norway are concentrated in the top right corner of the grid, which means a high power and a high interest. So this industry is a, what they call a stakeholder driven industry. Well, if you look down, you can see the, the grid of carb is much more scattered. So the, uh, yeah, the, 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 some of the stakeholders that have interest to innovate, they, they might not have the power or the other way around. So it's much, more, much harder to implement innovation here. And we also asked the, stakeholders then to to score the different innovations uh, in terms of their uh, personal awareness of this innovation uh, if the company has interest to to use this innovation and if the industry is interested so they um, got a score could get uh, uh, six points in total uh, yes would be two points one would be uncertain and uh, no interest would be zero and you can clearly see for, for Norway in the top of the slide that there is a lot of interest in the use of big data for fish welfare and for uh, farm performance and management support. Uh, and the other innovations, the novel feed ingredients, they also so score quite high, all above four. Now, when it, uh, we look at Poland, you can then see that there's much more focus on circular economy innovations like processing byproducts for feed and uh, using pond sludge for fertilizer and byproducts for cosmetics and nutraceuticals. Now, uh, there's also interest in novel feed ingredients, but this is, uh, is very minor because there's not much feed being used uh, in the, the carp industry. So the um, respondents in uh, the um, uh, survey respondents in, in uh, Poland, they clearly indicated that they see um, an opportunity in uh, increased processing of, of carp. So therefore, we have built a CARP processing model where we um, looked at the different product forms that are currently being consumed, uh, how that was in the past, and where we could go. So that means a fully processed CARP uh, resulting in fillets and, and byproducts, but also other product forms like CARP sheets, CARP slices, as you can see in the bottom picture. Uh, and um, yeah, what we did, we collected uh, data from the field and uh, uh, see what they could obtain for the byproducts, but also the costs associated with, uh, for example, dumping the byproducts on the on the landfill, which is a requirement if they're not being uh, being utilized. And you can clearly see that um, they can uh, get an increase uh, of they can add um, uh, they can get more value if they process their carb more, uh, going up from like nine slotties per kilo up to like. 11 12 slotties and then if you go to the graph on the right it also really depends where they utilize these byproducts so it's going into feed uh, then it gets a lower price compared when it's going to food applications and they can get probably a higher price if it goes into industrial applications so think about extracting collagen for uh, uh, from a carp skin so in in that case they could get a price up to 12 slotties uh, per kilo which is almost 50% more than, uh, than the baseline. Now it is important to take into account here that um, the costs associated with utilizing these byproducts are not being taken into account uh, because this uh, also requires economics of scale and much of these costs like packaging and uh, cooling are uh, relatively unknown because the industry uh, processing happens on such a small scale. So why is a better understanding of the supply chain important? Why do we want a more transparent uh, supply chain? And I will give you an example in relation to uh, circular economy uh, principles. So there's need for, for a more transparent, more traceable supply chain 
because of consumer demands. Uh, the consumer wants to know where's my fish from, is it safe to consume, uh, and uh, is it healthy? And this all comes down to concerns uh, that people have they, uh, about the products. They want to have more information, especially around seafood, because some people, they are aware that um, fish is imported, uh, seafood supply chains are very complex, and that there are, um, for, is, for example, uh, mislabeling. Um, and study indicated that 20% of the fish in the supermarket in the United States was uh, actually mislabeled. And think about, um, uh, you know, a farm shrimp being sold as a, as a wild shrimp, for example. And there's also illegal, unreported, and unregulated fisheries, which is a concern. And then when it comes to uh, the utilization of uh, fish byproducts, you want to uh, make sure that you're not feeding back fish to the, to the same species because this is, this is not allowed. Uh, and you want to meet uh, guidelines for safety and hygiene. So to give you a look into the um, com uh, how complex uh, these supply chains can be, and especially in terms of uh, processing, I dive a little bit into the um, the um, supply chain of the um, Atlantic salmon in the United Kingdom. Sorry. So what happens is um, the primary processing stage of uh, production here uh, results in viscera being available in the United Kingdom, and of course, head on gutted. But then there's also imports of Norwegian salmon um, because the United Kingdom exports um, part of their own salmon abroad, so they have to make up for their own demand. So what's happening is that the uh, Norwegian salmon, the secondary processing of the Norwegian salmon, these byproducts basically become available uh, in the United Kingdom. But then when we zoom in on the Norwegian uh, salmon production in Norway, which is the, the largest producer of salmon in Europe, then what happens is the primary processing uh, happens in uh, Norway, uh, which results in Viscra. But then most of the production is actually being exported to East European countries like, like Poland. Um, so what, you, what happens here is this creates lots of employment in, uh, in, in Poland, which uh, basically um, has a positive effect on the social uh, sustainability indicators. Uh, because it, it creates employment, economic opportunities, but it also creates resources uh, for Poland to feed, for example, their, their livestock industry. Um, so this, this clearly indicates the socioeconomic spillovers that you can have when you, you um, secondary process salmon, salmon abroad. So you can see a relation here between uh, Norway and Poland, and also um, the, the, the Poland is exploring um, processing of carp, and as there's already facilities of, of salmon uh, up north in Poland, uh, this uh, yeah could lower the, the barrier and, and uh, can function as a driver to uh, help the uh, Poland to uh, process carp more intensively. I think we would like to thank you for listening. Um, if you have any more questions, do not hesitate to contact us through the email or uh, social media, whatever works for you. We're happy to discuss things.